No two beer drinkers are the same, and some of us are more sensitive to certain off flavours than others, but a universally despised off flavour is the result of oxidation. Oxidised beer sucks. One way to starve off those stalling flavours is the addition of a chemical antioxidant called ascorbic acid. But does it actually work, and when should you add it? Well, Brewlosophy contributor Will Lovell has been trying to find out. He brewed three beers and ran 42 triangle tests to evaluate the impact of ascorbic acid in the brewing process. What did his results tell us? Let's find out. This episode is sponsored by Delta Brewing Systems. More on them in a bit. Oxidation can occur at various points in the brewing process, and once it's there, well, good luck getting rid of it. Ascorbic acid has been widely used as an effective means of preventing oxidation in wine, so could it work for beer as well? And when should it be added into the brewing process? You could add it in the mash or at packaging time. Well, Will, what got you interested in testing out this variable? Well, there is quite a large contingency on the internet that is very much pro-ascorbic acid, and it is an antioxidant, and, um, you know, some people are sensitive to things like sulfites, so it makes sense to want to try to pursue something that isn't a sulfite that can help you uh, remove oxygen um, from your packaging. But if you pick up the package of ascorbic acid at the homebrew store, there it is right there on the label. It says, use one teaspoon for a five gallon at packaging. So I said, well... If we're going to test ascorbic acid, why don't we test what's on the label first? Right. So let's start with that first experiment, which was to evaluate the differences between a West Coast Pilsner where ascorbic acid was added at packaging and one was not dosed with ascorbic acid. So why did you pick a a West Coast Pils for this experiment, Will? Well, um, West Coast Pils is a nice hoppy style. It's, It's very much a hop forward, but it's also a little bit lighter in character than some other ones. So I thought that, you know, maybe if, because it is a little bit lighter in malt character and some other characteristics and it's more hop forward, especially with that dry hop finish, and there's not a lot of yeast character in there because normally you're using something like uh, Global that doesn't give off a lot of yeast character or esters or phenols, that this might be a really good style for just trying it out and seeing how does this actually work in um, preventing oxidation. Right, and we've got some pictures of your brew day. So you mash the beer in a single vessel, adding your hop, additions into the kettle during the boil then chilling racking to a fermenter and adding yeast which in this case was imperial yeast global it's not often we get all the way to the beer in the fermenter without introducing the variable i think you set some kind of record here let me tell you i'm glad i did kind of a smaller uh split bash because i was really worried about uh oxidation like i'm hopeful i'm really 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 hoping that we have a new method of keeping oxidation at bay but uh but also i'm a little bit skeptical and i don't really want to have to deal with um you know, 10 gallons of oxidized beer around either. So, so I think, so at this point, it's pretty exciting. Only having to brew one beer to get this experiment going. Right. So the variable did come into play during packaging. You cold crashed the beer to 35 Fahrenheit or two Celsius for 24 hours. Then you added about three grams of ascorbic acid to one keg, and then the other didn't receive any. Then you added the beer on top, forgoing your usual CO2 purging of the kegs. Why did you forego purging the kegs? Going for extreme, here we are, we're not going to purge these kegs, which to me is a little bit insanity, uh, but you know, who am I? I'm, I'm, I'm up for a good time and, and hopefully not wasting all those hops that I just put into this beer. And so we, uh, we definitely, we, we didn't purge the kegs as soon as it was done. Um, I just kind of put it in on top, sealed them both up. Um, I think I probably purged the headspace just a little bit at the end of it all. But as far as uh, CO2 purging the kegs... There was no CO2 purging, just one treated with uh, roughly 2.7 grams of ascorbic acid and the other one treated with um, nothing, basically, just just sitting there, oxygen, barren and exposed. Poor, poor thing. Right. And then after three weeks of conditioning and then I suppose potential three weeks of oxidation, the beers were ready for evaluation. And to me, they both look a little bit hazy, but maybe the untreated beer looks a touch darker, which is often a sign of oxidation. What did you think when you actually saw these in person? So I think the, the, the you know, lighting can play a difference. I'm not sure that these beers looked all that different, but you know, even if you look at the picture, it's just a, it's just a, a touch darker. So it could just be lighting. Uh, but you know, they they look practically the same basically now a total of 21 people participated in the experiment each participant was served two samples of the non-dose beer and one sample of the beer dosed with ascorbic acid at packaging in different colored cups and then asked to identify the unique sample now while 12 tasters would have had to accurately identify the unique sample to reach statistical significance a total of eight did 
That indicates participants in this experiment were unable to reliably distinguish the beers. And Will, I believe your own testing was similar. You only correctly identified the odd beer out twice in five attempts. Yes, two out of five times. And sadly enough, um, I perceive Mother's Fear to have that kind of slightly stale uh, flavor with, with some muted hop character. Unfortunately, without doing any CO2 purging, I don't think the ascorbic acid could quite creep up with all that oxygen scrubbing. Then when we published these findings on brewlosophy.com, we received a bunch of comments suggesting that packaging might not actually be the best time to add the ascorbic acid. But readers were suggesting we might see more of an effect adding the acid during the mash instead. So that led you, Will, to conducting a whole new experiment. And before we get to that, a quick word on today's sponsor, and that's Delta Brewing Systems. Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on stainless steel brewing gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 litres of wort, comes with a domed lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow-off. Plus, it can hold up to 2 psi of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, which Will has used in his experiments here, no less. And their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, do yourself a favor and head over to deltabrewingsystems.com today. Okay, so the purpose of the second experiment was to evaluate the effects of adding ascorbic acid to the mash, this time on a hazy IPA. The idea being that by adding ascorbic acid into the mash, you are purportedly preventing oxidative compounds from even forming. And with hazy IPA being such a sensitive beer to oxygen, this seemed like a, a solid choice of style, Will. Yes. Um, so again, as you already mentioned, after performing the first experiment, everyone's like, well, what about using it in the mash? Well, to prove that we actually listen to your feedback and listen to what you're saying, here it is in the mash. So uh, we're going to see. Um, so there's lots of claims around and using it in the mash uh, about staving off oxidative compounds. I am curious to test this and why not do a hazy IPA to, to put it to the test? Right. So, so tell me through your hazy IPA recipe, first of all. I did about 74% uh, pale malt, 11% uh, or so uh, didn't get any wheat malt from Tex Malt, a little over a pound of flaked oats, which came out to be 7% of the malt bill. I did about 5% of the malt bill as flaked barley. And then I, um, just a touch for a little bit of color, did about 2% honey malt. And that was pretty much the malt bill. The, the hop bill, I did about 8 grams of Warrior at the 60-minute mark. And then I did uh, 30 grams of Centennial at 15 minutes. At five minutes, I did 30 grams of Brew One Lupomax and 30 grams of Citra. And then uh, right there at Flame Out, I did um, 30 grams of Brew One Lupomax, 30 grams of Citra Lupinax, and 30 grams of Eucanaut Lupomax. I then came along to dry hop it about um, two days. I think it was about 48 hours in, trying to hit that high cross and biotransformation period that everyone magically talks about that I'm not sure exists. And I did 60 grams of Brew One Lupomax. 60 grams of Eucanaut Lupamax and another 30 grams of Citra Lupamax. So it's a pretty massive uh, amount of hops into this beer. Yeah, I would imagine your hop freezer was looking a little empty after after that brew day. Lord, I wish it was. We've got so much in there, it's it's, it's ridiculous. So we, we need some more of these IPA experiments just to get through that. So so talk me through your brew day, and, and let's particularly focus in on where the variable was, which this time was in the mash. Usually I like to go in, I, you know, I think I work from home that day. So over my lunch break, I went in and prepped my RO water and then also um, milled two identical grain bills. And then that evening after work, about, you know, a little after five, I just walked in my garage to properly heated water. And then um, before mashing, I measured out five grams of ascorbic acid. Uh, and then as I'm just uh, essentially, as I understand it, as you're you're pouring the, the milled grains into the mash and stirring, like after I kind of got it stirred in uh, and got the mash going, I literally just right there at minute zero of the mash i added the ascorbic acid and stirred that in and let it do its thing so really cool thing i actually for fermentation i used l22 capri which was one of the first times i've used it so i actually got to ferment this a little bit warmer than normal because i was think i was right around 70 degrees seven you know trying 70 72 degrees try to really bring out that capri uh, so that's kind of fun since it's a kvike but yeah at packaging i didn't do anything different um just wanted to see usually hazy ipa they oxidize fast enough in my experience that um you know, they're almost changing flavor at the first week mark. So uh, if it is going to stave off staling, you're going to notice it in a hurry. Uh, no need to kind of introduce extra oxygen here, at least in my opinion. So I thought for at least for a baseline, let's just leave it as is. So they went into CO2 purge kicks. 
Okay, so beers came out, they're ready to, to test. Now, you did your own triangle test, and it seems that you didn't do so well, only two right out of five. Yes, I was kind of surprised. So again, I gave them about three and a half weeks before trying them, and I did my uh, triangle tests, and I only got two out of the five correct. Um, both of them had a nice uh, tropical aroma and flavor. Uh, they were both pretty decent beers, in my opinion. But uh, but yeah, no, nothing nothing out of the ordinary. Okay, now this is actually weeks later, and we've ended up with a bit of a recount on this experiment. So Will and I are back to discuss this. Let me reveal the results. We presented the beer to 20 participants where they received one sample of the beer where ascorbic acid was used in the mash and two samples that were untreated and then asked to pick the odd beer out. At this sample size, 11 participants needed to correctly identify the odd beer out to reach statistical significance and a total of 11 did meaning this is a significant result. Will, what do you make of that? Well, uh, just by the hair of our chinny chin tins, we, we came in with a uh, significant result. Um, obviously, I, I couldn't tell them apart, but my wife swears up and down over and over and over again that she could. So I guess this gives her some validation. She'll feel much relieved when I give her uh, these results. Participants who made the accurate selection on the test were asked to give their preference. A total of three tasters reported preferring the beer made without ascorbic acid. Seven said they liked the beer made with ascorbic acid more, and one had no preference. Now, you mentioned that your wife had a preference as to where this fell. Ironically, um, when I talked to her about it, she much preferred the one without the ascorbic and the uh, match. So, uh, you know, as far as flavor goes, who knows? Um, you know, preference is preference, but uh, but she apparently much preferred that one. So that's very interesting. So potentially your wife preferred the more oxidized beer. Maybe she's just used to drinking your other beers and that's how we got to that. I mean, I did used to make <laughs> oxidized messes all the time. And so, uh, and, and if there's a hazy, I'm the one that's going to oxidize it, which is what's ironic about me doing a hazy IPA experiment. So who knows? No, I'm kidding. Your beers are, I'm sure, extremely wonderful, even though I very rarely get to try them, unfortunately. Now, 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 let's think about what this means overall then, because we've looked at ascorbic acid in two different situations here. What sort of conclusions can we draw? It could be a really cool finding. If there is like a prophylactic effect where ascorbic acid can prevent oxidation by adding to the mash, I mean, that, that would just confirm that there's potentially one more tool one more place to uh, prevent oxidation in our hoppy beers. Maybe there is something to this, and it's and, and honestly, you know, it doesn't take an awful lot of effort to do it right. So it's kind of a bit of insurance. You might consider, you know, just why not? Five grams into the mash, and honestly, it took uh, probably more time to find the package and measure it than it did to add it. And, and honestly, you got a whole hour to burn there. So what else are you doing with your life in the mash that you can't just add a little dab of ascorbic? Exactly. And speaking of insurance, if you're interested in some other kind of things you can do for insurance, you can find out more about that in this video here.